Good morning. Can I ask our friends and colleagues to please start to come in and take your seat? We will start in two minutes. Good morning once again. Can I just invite everyone to please take the seats in front of you so that we can be much more tighter and closer to each other? If, if you can take the seats. Um, yeah. Okay, can I invite everyone to please take your seats? We're about to commence our proceedings for the day. If everyone can take your seat and make yourself comfortable. Okay, um, just before we start formally, can I just remind you that there will be uh, interpretation devices. If you need interpretation, 
please register for this uh, unit. Uh, channel one is Thai and Lao. Channel two is Khmer. Channel three is Vietnam. Channel four is English. And then also online. If you're joining online, there's also language interpretation online. And you just have to change the language to either English, Thai, yeah, or other languages listed there. So you go to Zoom, change language interpretation. Online, if there are problems, please reach out to uh, the facilitators. For now, can I invite our, um, my co-facilitators, Klomchit, uh, our MTT program advisor, and Buripat Libel, our MTT component coordinator, to come with me on stage. So uh, the three of us will be responsible for running the day. Uh, Klomjit and Buripat will be facilitating online participation, so they will be interacting with our online guests. Now, as you uh, get comfortable with your seats, can I ask uh, uh, you to get your um, devices, your cell phones, your cell phones, and if you need, and if you need uh, Wi-Fi access, the Wi-Fi network is Marriott Bonvoy, and the conference code is SEI2024. So. You're all connected now with your devices, and then Agus, can we run the first poll? So just to, for us to get to know each other and um, interact. Agus? So the first question is, Um, yeah, we're still trying to sort out the connections early in the morning, so I think the wires are a bit frozen. Right, the first poll. Okay, so we will be asking you four questions just to get to know each other. Now, if you can scan the QR code or you go to bvox.app, and then enter the ID 159-418-930. Okay. We're all in now. Great. Can I have the first question, please? So how is everyone feeling today? A few of you might be jet lagged, excited. So how is everyone feeling today, this morning? Let us know how you feel. Worried, happy, okay, so far we have 69 people, we have 74 people online. Our online participants, please also join in the poll. You should be able to see the link on your screen. So how is everyone feeling today? Agus, can we show the results now? Oh, very good. Good, great, happy, excited. Um, I'm glad. Oh, a bit sleepy. We can help you with some coffee outside. Stressful. So hopefully some of our activities today would help you relieve some of your stress. You will get energized. Exhausted, okay, I think, yeah, there, we can be really exhausted, but if we can help each other, um, we can also help you with your uh, exhaustion, tired. Okay, that's interesting. Now, let's go to the next question, please.
Okay, so what are you most looking forward to learning about today? Let's see whether what you're expecting is something that we can deliver today. So this is uh, the Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tank Policy Forum 2024. Networking, definitely, it's an opportunity for networking, policy engagement. I think we'll learn more. We're going to reflect about policy engagement. If there have been um, good experiences, some challenges, and also some steps forward, we'll discuss climate change issues also, particularly tomorrow in the roundtable. There will be a lot of discussions about climate change issues. We will try to offer new knowledge, new information, enabling collaboration partnership some people will be reportering that's good some findings also will be shared some discussions about beneficiaries best practices resilient strategies discussions also around gender equality that's very good um, we will have a lot of that because one of the important theme that we will discuss today is around gender equality and social inclusion. Great, thanks a lot. Can I have the next question, please? Okay, so at this very moment, where are you joining from? So you pin on the map. At this very moment, where are you joining from? Okay, of course, a number of us are joining from Bangkok, Thailand, but some are joining in the oceans. So they must be in their yachts at the moment, coming towards Bangkok, but that's good. So that means they're online uh, sailing towards us. So some people also are joining from Australia and another in another, other continents. Again, more people are in the oceans. So I hope this is just a map problem. They're not really in the oceans. But good to know that we have a lot of colleagues joining from other places, but most of us are here. Okay, let's, let's wait a bit. Um, okay, so more and more people are joining from other places. Great, but of course, there's a lot of people here with us right now. That's good. Great. So just to show, quite a number of people also are in, in different places aside from Bangkok, Thailand at the moment. And it's, um, yeah, and here where the number is increasing. So that's great. And uh, our people joining virtually, we have Boripat and Klomjit who will be facilitating that conversation. Okay. My final question, um, Agus, can I have the next question, please? Okay, which country are you from? Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam? And then the bottom one, actually, if you can scroll up, is other non-Mekong countries. So let's see.
Okay, we have a lot of friends from uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and a, a, a large contingent from Vietnam. Can we scroll the rest of the screen? Can you scroll up, Agus? We have, we, okay, and other non-Mekong countries. Just so that we know who they are, can I ask our Cambodian friends to please stand up? Anyone from Cambodia? And let's give a big round of applause from our friends from Cambodia. So if you want to reach out to them, have a chat, have a networking, talk about something to collaborate on, you would know you have already their uh, faces. Can I have our friends from Laos to please stand up? Yes, these are our friends from Laos. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Our friends from Myanmar. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a few of them. Welcome also. Welcome. Thailand, our friends from Thailand. So these are our friends from Thailand. Welcome also. Vietnam. Our friends, there's a lot of friends from Vietnam who are here. Good to know. Welcome, everyone. And uh, China, our friends from China. Yeah. Very good. Our friends from other non-Mekong countries. Please stand up. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. All right, now can I also, while we're trying to introduce ourselves, if you can just face to each other. So the, the first row in front of you, if you can face the next row, and then, then the next row. Yeah, so every two rows, if you can talk and have a chat and say hi to each other, yeah? So just say hi, and if there's anything that you would like to share from your bio. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you may now be seated. I'm glad you have met new friends, new partners, new collaborators. Our theme for this year's forum is empowering agents of change, strengthening water, energy, climate research, and policy interfaces in the Mekong region. Now, may I invite Mr. Niall O'Connor, SEI Asia Center Director and Mekong Think Tank Program Steering Committee Chair, to tell, I was, to tell us why this forum is important and why SEI is facilitating this. And then, can I also ask Niall to introduce our friends who will welcome everyone. Yeah. You can wait here. I, I like here. Good morning. Oops, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I know one of the emails that went out recently said we should wear a national dress to this event, so I'm wearing a very traditional Irish tweed jacket, which is extremely hot in this climate, so forgive me. But at least it's traditional. But it's great to have everybody here this morning. Um, we're delighted to have, I think, about 50 or 60 different partner organizations coming in these days, which I think is truly a, a great gathering of incredible minds in the region to try and develop what we're talking about, this uh, policy forum today. Um, it's pressing because we're dealing with issues around water, around climate, and in some cases around energy. And we all know over the last few weeks how difficult and challenging it has been in northern Thailand with the floods um, and the impact that that's having on people's lives. 
but we also know what's happening elsewhere around the world, that climate is really impacting people today. So it's really important that we can bring people together to try and figure out how do we come together as institutions to drive for change and positive change. And for us here at SEI, it's important that it's evidence-based science change, that we're leading on the scientific input to decision-making to ensure that we're doing the right things moving forward. Um, it's important that we're looking at environment and economic sustainability as well, so that we're trying to strive to get out of the climate challenges we have, but to create a sustainable future into the, in, into the future, I should say. So to do that, we're looking for greater collaboration, and that's what this whole meeting is about. It's collaborating, bringing all the partners together. And it's very important that we have our key colleagues here, so not only all of the members of the MTT Alliance and also the members of Summernet, but the partners who finance that and support that. So we have our colleagues from DFAT, um, Shane and Dwight are here, who are giving their ongoing support to the work that we're doing in this alliance. Um, unfortunately, CEDA is unable to attend today, but they're very keen to say that they're also continuing to support the work that we're doing. So for both of those partners, it's really important that they're here to hear how you, who are the key partners from academia, from government, from civil society, and some from the private sector, how we come together to try and develop you know, knowledge-based, uh, evidence-based science and policy decision-making. So part of the forum today is about empowering all of us as agents of change and how we're going to do that. We want to increase the amount of dialogue that we're having amongst partner organizations, amongst different sectors, academia, government, knowledge and government. We want to also make sure that we're bringing private sector into those dialogues so that we have a whole of society approach to understanding the complex problems and to addressing those problems. So through the course of today's forums and uh, over the next few days, I think there's further capacity development on Thursday as well, we want to look at how we can increase leadership support to this alliance, how we can increase capacity development support for what is needed to drive at a national and at a regional level. We want to enhance policy development among all of these knowledge-based policy influencing organizations who are key to driving from the ground up grassroots understandings of what the issues are through to national level policy and up into regional level policy. So that is in itself bringing the alliance together to really drive the, the future agenda. Um, so I think it's great, as I said earlier, we have the willingness of the, the key donors in this, with DFAT and CEDA, to see how we can combine these programs in the future, that they are both driving towards added knowledge and research, um, using that research to influence policy and driving policy at national and regional levels. So hopefully we can continue to streamline these programs to increase efficiency and resource use so that we have more funds going to the people who need it and less to management. And we want to make sure that all of the stakeholders involved get the support they need. Um, today, let's try and focus on renewing some of these partnerships. SDG 17 is about partnerships. Renew what we've already developed, but also reach out and build new partners. Who have you not met in the room over the last few years? Talk to them and develop new partnerships as we move forward. And then just lastly, just from an SEI point of view, we want to also commit to this process. Um, SEI, you'll see on the back wall, has been here for 20 years. Uh, we're going to continue um, over the next 20 plus years, we hope. And as a commitment to that, I very much wanted to welcome our board and our executive director who are here also for this week. Um, you will meet them during the course of this week, but that's also a show of commitment of SEI as an institute, both to Thailand and to Asia and to the work that we're doing. So uh, we hope to commit long-term and support long-term where we can. So very much now, we look forward to, um, I suppose, engaging discussions. We want you as kind of, in this context, participants to challenge what we talk about, to challenge our colleagues, to try and help inspire us to do better moving forward. Um, let's not sit quietly and just listen in to everything. Let's open up, challenge, and have that dialogue so that we can develop moving forward. So with that, I, am, I wanted to just say a big thanks to all of those who made it here today, and we look forward to hearing from you over the course of the next uh, three days with, with uh, the various forms that we have. Um, and thank you. Um, we will enjoy the rest of the day. So do you want me to introduce next? I, I see you're kind of ready to get up off your seat there. But um, first of all, we're going to have a few more little opening remarks. So please, could I invite um, uh, Professor Per Mikwitz, uh, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Sustainability and Campus Development at the Lund University in Sweden. The, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Dear Shane McKinnon and uh, Professor 
Undran Lankoy, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, we are in a big mess. And I don't mean just us in this room, and I don't mean just because you have to listen to me early in the morning. I mean humanity. We are in a big mess because of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. We have a huge environmental crisis at hand. We need to take action to get out of this mess. And in order to get out of this mess, it's not enough that we reduce pollution and emissions. We need to change, fundamentally, the production and consumption systems of the globe. And actually, I see the situation in the Mekong uh, River region as an example of the mess where we are. Also here, we have climate change, biodiversity loss, and we have environmental degradation affecting the millions of people who are living in this region. However, there are some good news as well. In order to get out of this mess, we need knowledge, and we have more knowledge available now than ever before. There are more than double the amount of universities today than they used to be a couple of decades ago. There are much more skilled young people than ever before. However, unfortunately, a lot of this knowledge that is produced is not used in policy making and decision making. It's partly due to the features of policy making, but it's also partly due to the features of producing knowledge. At the universities that I come from, we are very good at producing knowledge about problems, but less good at focusing on solutions. Uh, and we are very much focusing on what is the new knowledge, the newest knowledge we can produce, instead of what is the needed knowledge for the decision-making processes. So in order to enhance that knowledge is really used, research has shown that we need intermediaries something that connects decision-making with knowledge production. And, and that in order for a sustainable transformation to happen. One way to see these uh, intermediaries, and one of the most important intermediaries in this, in this area, is actually a Stockholm Environment Institute um, this, uh, that I'm happy to be a member of the board. But also the specific programs that we are here to, to discussing these days the Mekong, uh, the, the, in, for the Mekong region, including the, the uh, Sumer uh, uh, Net, uh, the Sustainable Mekong Research Network, and the Mekong Taught Leadership and Think Tank Network, MTT. Both problems are addressing pressing environmental and governance challenges and connecting uh, uh, research and knowledge with action at the regional and local level in relation to water, energy, and climate change, among other pressing issues. Enhancing the transition of the sustainable, the, the, to sustainable consumption and production systems require actions taken at many, many different levels, but especially important are actions taken at the local level. <clears throat> that is why it's crucial that MTT works in the Mekong re region to empower local knowledge-based policy organizations and think tank, and forming alliances to influence policymaking and decision-making. <clears throat> there are three reason, main reasons why knowledge is not used as much as it could be. Uh, uh, there is too little focus on, on, on solutions, and the, the, the knowledge is not locally relevant, and it's not targeting the users um, at the local level. That is why Stockholm Environment Institute and these programs are really valuing the collaboration with, with partnerships. And the partnership approach is in the, in the core of this work. We collaborate with the lo regional and local think tanks and produce knowledge focused on solutions. Um, <clears throat> and, and the aim is to produce knowledge that is really tailored to the specific needs. 
Research also shows that knowledge is more likely to be used if it's co-produced with stakeholders. And that is how we work in these in this, uh, 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 pro programs, by facilitating dialogue between policymakers, researchers, and local communities. In order for this to be, uh, be uh, uh, successful, a transition will have to be inclusive and just, and that is uh, the kind of solutions we are looking for, including also marginalized and vulnerable groups, women, children, ethnic minorities, and people with disabilities. Gender inclusion is a particular priority for SIA. With that, I want to say that, that today's uh, the, 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 the event, uh, the Mekong Regional Water, Energy and Climate Policy Forum, and the whole Mekong Environment Resilience Week, it's an important event for us to share knowledge, to exchange views, and to jointly produce new insights. It's my pleasure as a member of the board to welcome you all to the Me Mekong Regional Water, Energy and Climate Policy Forum 2024. I wish you all an insightful, uh, insightful discussions and a successful event uh, aimed at shaping a brighter future for the Mekong region and its people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Per, for those uh, challenging and inspiring words and indeed a call for greater partnerships. Um, obviously, I couldn't stop him going over five minutes. He's my board member, so um, you're welcome. But uh, thank you very much for that. But now, as you talk about key partnerships, I'd like to invite one of our key partners here uh, in Thailand, and that's Chulalongkorn University, who have been very, very supportive of the work that SEI does. So I'm very happy to um, ask Professor Unruan Leknoy uh, to join us as the director of the Chulalongkorn University's Social Research Institute and key partner. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Niall O'Connor, Professor Pam Metwitz, Mr. Chance McKenna, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, valued participants. It is with guest honor and heartfelt gratitude that I welcome each of you to the Mekong Regional Water, Energy, and Climate Policy Forum 2024. Today's mark not just another gathering, but a powerful moment where billion minds from diverse fields come together, united by common goals, to address the passing challenges our region and our world face. I would like to express my deep appreciation for your presence and commitment to this important cause. Your participation is testament to the cherished we hold to not only discuss but take decisive action to shaping a more sustainable and resilient future. At Chulalongkorn University Social Research Institute, we take immense pride in our partnership with the Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI. This is not an ordinary partnership. It is a collaborative mutual on mutual trust, chair expertise, and a deep unwavering commitment meant to solving global issue. Together, SEI and KUSLI stand at pillar of strength, driving innovative solutions through the seamless integration of research and policy. What makes our partner, uh, partnership so impactful is our aligned purpose. Both SEI and KUSLI understand the existing today's complex water Energy and climate challenges require not just knowledge, but action, both strategic and informed action. By harnessing our expertise and combining our efforts, we are positioned to make a truly global impact. As we embark on today's discussions, I am filled with optimism, the conversation we will have, the insight we will share, and the solution we will develop will not only contribute to the resilience of the Mekong region, 
but will inspire global exchange. I encourage each of you to engage fully, share openly, and leave this forum with renewed energy and idea to drive us forward. Once again, thank you for being part for this remarkable forum. Your presence and contribution are invaluable, and I look forward to the powerful and positive outcome we will create together. I wish you all a productive and inspiring day ahead. Together, we will make a lasting difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Unruan. And just to highlight the strategic partnership we have with Chula Longcorn and the support that you've given us over the years is very, very much appreciated, so thank you. Um, last but not least, I'd like to call on our good friend uh, from DFAT, uh, Shane McKenna, to join us on stage. Shane is obviously with Dwight and the Embassy being a very strong supporter of the MTT programme, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Niall. Um, and thank you for uh, my fellow speakers, uh, Professor Per Mikwitz and Associate Professor Dr. Uriran. Um, also welcome Kunsurian and other distinguished guests here today. Um, friends who have travelled so far to, uh, to be here, whether it's from the Mekong region or uh, beyond. And, and I see we have people online, as you say, from some middle of the ocean somewhere. So that's, it's great that everyone could join us here and, and, and take your time to uh, contribute to today's policy discussions. Well, we had a few interesting messages this morning. Uh, it is a mess. <laughs> um, I'd like to reflect on that note on why we are actually here today. Um, we, uh, we all fundamentally have the same, the same goal. Uh, we want to, all of us, achieve a prosperous, a peaceful, a climate resilient, an environmentally uh, resilient region. Um, we, we all recognise that there are multiple paths to achieving each of these goals. Um, these paths are both bilateral, but they also cross national borders. They, cry, they um, require partnerships and collaboration. But it also requires locally led solutions, locally led analysis, locally led understanding of problems. Um, without a local, local leadership and locally led and produced research analysis, um, we won't have uh, policymakers empowered to make local uh, solution, uh, decisions to, to um, uh, bring solutions to the region that are fit and fit for purpose. Um, they won't own the solutions and they uh, won't be able to be held accountable to the solutions that are developed. Today in this room we have a variety of, of people present. Think tanks, NGOs, government, um, research organisations, and each plays a very important role in contributing to these, the achievement of these goals. Um, each of your organisations collect data, they produce analysis, they use data, um, they, um, they understand the actions that are needed and the consequence of actions, but also they um, have a role in explaining the consequence of no action. The networks have been formed in this room. The, the alliances that were mentioned earlier are fantastic. Um, this is one of the great strengths of any regional approach to policy solutions. Um, it brings together the individual strengths, not only within each country that's represented here, but across the borders. Um, it allows a consistent messaging uh, to be delivered region-wide rather than just in a bilateral uh, sense. However, I'm going to pose a few questions. Um, is this, uh, are all of these wonderful strengths that we have in this room sufficient to be, to be really deliberate policy influences in the region? And that's actually my first question. How is it that um, we, we work towards a, a system where research is deliberately connected with the policies uh, of interest to the policy makers? To maximise the relevance of policy and to ensure that the, the research we all undertake is, is actually used and relevant, um, it's important that policymakers play a role in developing and instigating the research that matters to making the policy decisions. Bringing policymakers along the journey with us 
is, is going to be critical in terms of getting outcomes that we might want to, to achieve. We must influence policymakers through the methodology as much as the outcome of the research itself. Now, this is fine bilaterally, but it's challenging on a regional basis. Uh, regional uh, solutions require regional outcomes. So how do we ensure that the needs of the different decision makers, which are by definition bilateral national decision makers, whether it's government, whether it's business, whether it's NGOs, because there's a range of different policy decision makers, um, how, do we, how do we address their needs in terms of what they may need to make influential policy decisions? The second question is, how can we in, in improve the inclusivity of the research and hence the potential benefit of the, of the policy solutions? We all know that public support is critical in instigating policy change. So how do we bring communities along the journey with us? How do we, how do we undertake the research that we do, inclusive of all of our stakeholders? The voices of w w men and women are equally important and bring different perspectives. Likewise, the voices of the youth and of the aged, people with disabilities, minorities. How do we ensure that all of our stakeholders have an active contribution to the solutions uh, to the important matters that we're discussing? The third question is how do we reach our audiences? Now, on a bilateral basis and a national sense, that's not so difficult. There are plenty of, of fora, there's the one-on-one -on -one discussions that I'm sure each of your institutions have with various policymakers. Uh, it's, it's quite a standard practice. On a Mekong regional basis, how do, we, how do we do that? There are some fantastic forums. Today is one such policy discussion, and uh, we're very grateful to, to SEI and others in this room for organizing this. It's really important. Another is tomorrow. We have the climate workshop where, where key and very important dis discussions will occur. Um, we have the Mekong Forum, which is one of the very few local, regional institutions that brings forward a fora for policy discussion. But are these sufficient? Are these, are these fora that we have uh, established, do they capture all the stakeholders we want to capture? Do they allow the debates that we want to have? Do they provide a safe space to disagree? Um, it's a question that luckily I don't have to answer. Uh, it's, it's a question that needs to be answered by, by you in the room, by people living in, an, in the Mekong region. What is appropriate for, for your own circumstances? And I got a bit ahead of myself because I have a final and very important question. Um, how do we balance the demand for research with the supply of research? And this comes back to a, a previous comment that uh, my fellow speaker uh, mentioned. Um, it's, it's one thing for us to, to produce what we know is, is important, important analysis, important outcomes, and to make recommendations on how to, uh, on, on various solutions to the problems that we face across the region, across the globe. But if that research doesn't have a demand from a decision maker, how is it that we influence the agenda? What are the barriers that, that are currently in place that prevents policymakers in commissioning research on a regional basis? I think bilaterally there's, there's you know, on a national basis it's one thing, but on a regional basis where, where, um, where the issues cross borders, cross national borders, and require consistent and, and deliberate inter, interventions, how do, we, how do we better target this? How do we remove the barriers to, to that demand side? I mean, ultimately, my job is to, do, is, to, is to work so that I don't have a job anymore, right? So the, the, uh, the, the local ownership of these fora is, is really important. And identifying what is appropriate for the Mekong region is equally important. And it can be a variety of answers there. Luckily, again, I do not have to answer those. It is for the, for the people and the organisations who, who live and work within the region to produce locally-led answers and local, local um, uh, solutions. What I can say, though, is from Australia's perspective, um, we, we are here to support um, evidence-based decision-making. But we are here to listen. Uh, we are here to understand the region 
and we are here to support local actors. Um, our approach um, is, is to partner, to support, and then provide and, and, and reach a situation where local ownership can then take over and run with, the, run with the solutions and the activities. We're a practical partner. And, and I think I should emphasize that. We are a really practical partner. We've been partnering with governments across the region for more than 70 years now. Um, uh, and, and I think the, the, the way we partner is, is also important. And we continue to support the resilient climate uh, adaptation mitigation across the Mekong region. We will continue to support water secure, uh, secure water management. We will continue to support economic resilience across, across the region. In fact, we've just announced a, a second phase of the Mekong Australia Partnership, which is a $222 million uh, five-year program of assistance for the Mekong in these areas. So our commitment uh, is long-lasting and will continue. I think the most important thing for us, though, is that we're here to learn. The discussion today, um, in the course of this week, tomorrow, uh, and, and uh, in other venues, will help us all understand, including ourselves in Australia, what the, what the core issues are and how we progress these issues to a sustainable, a sustainable um, solution. So, and I, I, I'm getting the signals, so on that note, <laughs> may I encourage, as Niall did and as my fellow speakers did, a really interactive forum today, and for those, and I hope you all do attend tomorrow, lots of questions, lots of discussion, um, so that we can better understand the local issues, because you have those, those answers, you have that information, uh, and you have that contribution to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Shane, if you could stay on stage, please. And if we could also invite uh, Professor Unruan and Professor Mikwitz to the stage, and Dr. Chianis also, please, uh, for some gifts. But just want to say I really like the unanswered questions that you have challenged us with. I think there's a lot of us in the room that are going to work on that. But I also like the opportunity of having the next five years to work with you to find solutions. So thank you. Albert. Thank you very much, Niall. Now um, is an opportunity for us to hand tokens of our appreciation to our guests. Um, we have some gifts here and... Okay, and can I request our guests to please stay uh, in front together with uh, Niall and uh, Dr. Chayanit for a group photo? Yeah, Dr. Chayanit is our deputy director, at the same time the program managers of the Summernet and MTT. A big round of applause to everyone. Thank you very much, and may I request Dr. Chayanis to please remain on stage for the introduction to the Mekong Regional Water Energy Climate Policy Forum 2024. Uh, Dr. Chayanis will also tell us what do we mean by policy influencing organizations and why they are important and why they are crucial to the Mekong. Dr. Chayanis, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Albert, and really thanks. Thank you so much for everyone here. By joining this policy forum, uh, you are welcome to be part of the MTT and the Summonet family members. I really fascinated uh, with the welcoming remark from many speakers previously that delivered to us. And one of the questions from Chen asking us whether we actually have a sufficient capacity or we are here, is it enough for us to really shape the world? And for me, uh, when I wa was introduced by our that I'm program director, 
maybe I guess that uh, I feel that maybe Albert probably better um, recommend me that I am from the Mekong and I'm a mother. I am a citizen of the Mekong who have a dream. What is our dream? Simple dream. And I think everyone here have your own dream is how can we really imagine the next 20 years and 30 years the Mekong still in a nice place for our child. My son now, he's 14 years old. He's always asked me many questions when he saw the news about what's happening in this world. Big flood and have really made the situations worse, not only properties, but also people die. People don't have like a place to live. Is this something beyond our human to cope with? Is it because of technologies? Or is it because we made a not really inclusive decisions? So this is a very simple question, but it's hardly for me to answer him, you know. And what I'm afraid most is it will be difficult for him to answer his kids also, because if now we know about the issue and problems, but we cannot give kind of advice that we truly believe that is good advice. How about our futures? So that's why I want to highlight what is really things we can do together today. So this particular event is one of 100 or even 1,000 events happening in the Mekong countries. But the reason why everyone here decided to be with us, I think we have some belief that this program, this work, this group of people will actually help making your dream coming closer if not become true. So I really hope we make this very open and also truly open your heart. Give out what you really feel, reflecting the communities you represent, talking on behalf of your organization, on behalf of your family, to really tell what really the core issues that we are facing. So that's what my request as a mother of a family with a child who have always the questions. Okay. So I hope that by the end of the day, we can tell ourselves these full days is really meaningful days that all of us has contributed. Next slide, please. So there are two things I would like to say. Is the first, this is a really regional platform for everyone. And this is really won't be able to happen without everyone. And of course, we have to recognize the organizer. We have our team here from Mekong Thought Leadership in Think Tank Network initiated by 25 organizations who have a common belief in this when we put this proposal together. And now we expand our partnership and family to include more than 50 organizations supporting this initiative that are part of Sustainable Mekong Research Network including more than 800 individual members for more than 200 organizations. Not everyone can be here, but we are represent those who have common belief. And we are very happy to have our dear colleagues from Jualongkong University Social Research Institute. Ajahn Undun is here, she is also a mother of really cute, children and child of the Mekong country. So I'm so happy here. Next, please. There's four things, the keywords that I like to highlight for today's event. The first is, this is a platform for us. And then this is a 
won't be, it will be similar to other 100 platform if we don't really talk. If we just listen, you don't need to be here. You can be anywhere. But once you are here, please take time, not only during the sessions, outside the sessions, please grab opportunities to do that. The second, we like to highlight importance of the evidence. The evidence we believe because this is the world of so many fake news. What we need is the fact. We need is information that coming from very rigorous process in getting and collecting. The third one is we need to help each other to be stronger. We thought about ourselves as a think tank, knowledge-based policy influence organizations, and we need to build others, people who we live as agents of change. Then in the next 20 years, it's not only us, same face, same experience to talk. We should have other people younger people who become leader and we go at the backstage to feel so happy and proud they are here. And the fourth thing is, I want to say on behalf of our program that all discussion you make today will actually shape the futures of our work under the MTT. Next, please. So, I got a lot of questions. What is KPBAO is? Why you make such terminology so complicated? Why don't you just say think tank? Everyone knows think tank and everyone so wow, we are so much elite who can advise government. No, it's not enough. Originally, when we have this proposal and program submitted, we even debate ourselves, are we believing this, the think tank role? We have so much people who want to give the advice, good advice. But what is the, the ground? What is justification, legitimacy for them to do that on our behalf? That's why we say 25 organizations joining this effort. We say we are not advisor to the government. So are we relevant to this program? Yes, because we give advice through different mechanisms, public, our kids. We talk with the teachers at school. All of this counted, that's why we use the concept of knowledge-based policy influence organization. Because they give advice using information in different way. They generate, they interpret, they communicate, they make people understand. It is written, it's verbal, it's picture, it's the voice, we all counted. That's why this has become policy influencing organizations that we can be part and be proud that this is our role. And that's why we can speak. Next, please. So I would like to highlight this is a work, not only by me, I have a big team. We have the big team led by Ajahn Louis, Dr. Louis Labelle from USA, and also a great member that many members here are contributing. Why? Because this work the result that I represent about 10 minutes here, coming from more than 100 organizations working in the Mekong that really have some way and some work influence the policy and practices over the past five years, 10 years, and more than 20 years. We classify the policy influence organizations in many forms, but I would like to highlight there are those groups who generate the information, knowledge themselves. There are those who interpret and make use of this and quite visible that they are influencing organizations. But there are so many other organizations that actually use the knowledge base, use local experience to influence the decisions and also practices. And policy could be coming from maybe like a commissions and also um, advice, but it has to target on either policy to improve or practice to improve or discontinue or to be formulated. Next, please. And we, why we do this? We already know about what we are doing, why we need to do this. We know ourselves, but do we know the other friends? 
what they are doing? Because of the question that chain posed, do we have enough? The reason why we put this program design together because we think it's not enough. We need a critical mass of people. We need alliance. We need a team who have really don't need to use the same strategies, but we can learn from each other because we are in different contexts. We would like to understand who are out there in the Mekong region, who are out there outside but work in the Mekong influence of decisions from elsewhere, um, from Pacific or from the ocean, we want to understand what are their strategies, you know, and how they influence that, what are the outcome. And we would like to understand, if we don't have enough, what are the capacity needs? Next, please. What we have done is we actually request our friends, partners, and who we don't know also, we ask them, please kindly respond. I would say very long survey. It took me almost an hour to ask to respond this. But believe it or not, people spend time. More than 100 organizations. Some question is very difficult to answer. I even need to check with my HR what is the response is. But this is really the breath and really the effort of all organizations put in this, you can see the graph here, how they represent not only academic, but many government, think tank, and local community advocacy contributed in this kind of study. Next, please. So you can see here, what are characteristics of this organization? Many of them are nonprofit, both formally registered and informally, government and others, it's really quite diverse, like a um, person giving this information. Next, please. And very interestingly, we see that many organizations actually work on like uh, three sectors. It's a core nexus on water, energy, and climate. And we believe that, oh, wow, that's fascinating. That means we are very in good positions, actually, to really make a difference when we saw and we see the core cause of problem because of cross-sector planning collaborations. This policy may make another policy become compromised and cannot be achieved. And why, why is still the problem? Is it because we don't really talk with each other or because we don't have real understanding what the nexus is. Or because we don't know how to communicate. We may know, but we don't know how to, or we don't know how to make people trust on our work and the strategies and message, key messages. Or we don't have enough voice to support that propositions. Next, please. So, and we found that, okay, most of us, majority of us organization, have three strategies to influence policy in a Mekong region. The first one is meet government strategies, regularly contact, build a partnership of our body partner, and making sure that it's not only that you invite them only for opening or closing remark, even, and you're not inviting or involve them only when you have the project that need them there. It's really partnership that build a long time. Second, broadcast public st strategy mean what? That means you don't need to meet people that you want to influence, but you make the public to be those who have the witness and also talk on our behalf. But because the public is coming, really become more influential these days. You social media, use other form of communication, use knowledge in public space to really make the voice without showing your face, without risking yourself physically, have direct face, that is another strategy. The third one is managing the bodily. What is that? It means 
the role of mediator, facilitator, ambassador. You know, everyone here can be ambassador. Bridging science policy also another role of ambassadors to make sure that it's not like, okay, you are doing this, you are great kind of, you know, academic, and the other group, oh, we are practical. This group need to talk more. And the role of the ambassador, a facilitator, is a key. And this is the role of knowledge-based policy inference organization. Next, please. And then what we actually would like to demonstrate and tell the world why we need more support. Many organizations highlighting the obstacles, lack of funding, everyone don't have enough, of course. Restriction in accessing information. Those who don't generate information knowledge themselves, they say, I know that there is some study, but I cannot get information. That's really fundamental of one of the issue of human right. Right to access to right information. And how we can make that knowledge accessible is very important. Unrealistic time frame to complete work. So this is very practical, some, being, some people are laughing, but it's truly the factors that make it the work half finished, you know? So that's really something we need to help and yeah. Next, please. And what are the things glue us together? Not only researcher, academic organization here, but we really recognize that the SDG, many people talk about SDG in many countries or many decades, a uh, few, like at the beginning, that so much question about this. But now all countries, almost all countries, they really place achieving SDG as a priority of the country. And that make it possible for us to use as entry point that our work can actually help support the like whoever have the attempt to achieve SDG, that this is really something we can help each other. Next, please. We actually um, want to really highlight the importance of the Jesse work. And many organizations here that work in France, the policy, they adopted the Jesse concept, you know, gender equality, disability, social inclusion in some way. They really try to do that, not only in their work, but also organizations. And that's why I really feel that we probably not tap into enough the experience, the capacity, and also strong wish of all organizations that want to make this happen. And one other thing pointed out very clearly in the current study is how to support people with this different uh, capacity. I don't want to say people with disability, but people with different capacities to be in the position that they can demonstrate their best capacities in the world, linking the water, energy, and climate. It is something more difficult in our findings. Next, please. And what is really the thing grew up here because our belief that by participating as part of the alliance and network is actually make us possible to be our work to do this better and more effectively. So almost all organizations responded, they believe in this, and that's why they responded the survey because they want to support this to happen. Next, please. And what are the capacity needs? Many organizations surprisingly put project management on top even higher than the research capacities. Monitoring evaluation, why? I just realized how to relate this because they say the first thing is obstacle is they don't have enough fun. The fun is not coming from the rain. It has to come from some support. Who provide the support? They have to write good proposal. They have to make a case. They have to monitor the past work. And that's something not inherited and probably taught in their school or their 
kind of uh, universities, how they do this? If they're not really studying in this sense, you know, they need this support, they need help, financial management. That's why I'm so happy we have today also my colleague from headquarters, Mary Simon. So you are really kind of helping and the backbone and helping us and many colleagues at the backside from operation team from SEI. They administer more than 100 contracts for this program. This just example. And for us who have experience for more than 20 years here, we still really need to face daily kind of challenge. And how about small organization just establish with have strong heart, strong will, they don't have experience. This is our task. Next, please. Research capacities, also, of course, this is not a surprise. Especially, we are helping and supporting young generation. They don't have so much experience on this. And this is our core business. We don't see it as a problem. But still, we need people to help, and not only like a TLE, but practical one. Next, please. And this is really everyone need to kind of learn from each other. What are engagement strategies? It's not because we don't know it all, but because we every day face with different kind of situations and different actors who we may discover that they actually very influential, but maybe they are behind the scene. You know, that's why this forum is a great forum for us to be together. Next, please. And in conclusions, we want to highlight that we actually have experience on this water, energy, and climate. And we adopted many strategies to really make this dream coming to, to give really kind of plausible advice. And many organizations have strong interest to be part of alliance and strong interest to really, how to say, have opportunity to access capacity building and want to belong together here. Next, please. And what are the influence? I got one question, two questions. Uh, Kun Gromjit told me that I have two questions, even I'm not presented yet. What actually influenced the program so far? Whether it's the same, what we have already in the design? No. We really changed a lot. We are program of learning, organization of learning. So this scoping study actually help us say, okay, you are not just call people to join you. You have to tell what's the benefit there, being part of Alliance. Make it explicit and what are their responsibility. Second, we have to really make sure that our call invitation for the program design is actually really make a kind of core heart and really inform what that policy gap you have. And we also need to really enhance our strategy for engagement using this information, design our capacity development activity, learning activity, reflecting this uh, kind of needs. And we also have to ensure that project management related topics also in there and have continued monitoring and evaluation. Next, please. Without that, with that, I would like to really convey my sincere thanks again to my all co-authors and also all uh, organizations responding this survey and great supporters from, uh, of course, Australian government and Swedish government, and especially all my team and the backside and all operation finance, admin, everyone here, and your time to participate in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chayanit. Um, I like that you shared your reflection and your conversation with your son and also uh, being the, the citizen of the Mekong, you rightly pointed out some of the challenges that we have. And also, um, you describe also what we mean by policy influencing organizations and how we can understand them in terms of their role, the knowledge base, or the kind of advice they're going to provide to policymakers. So for that, I hope we can have now a better understanding of what we are referring to when we say about policy influencing organizations. With that, can I ask everyone to please tell us who are the policy influencers here and who are the policymakers? So 
Again, if you can just take your uh, smartphones with you and scan this QR code. If you need a Wi-Fi signal, this is the, the password. Uh, SAI 2024. And then please help us answer. Tell us, who are you? Are you a policy influencing organization? Are you a policy maker or none of the above? Let's see how we look like in, in, in this room. Those who are online also, please also join. So right now we have at least um, 50 people online joining us in, in this conversation. And also if you'd like to ask questions or follow the conversation, you can also use our WOBA app to tell us what you feel about the, the sessions or if you have some questions to the speakers. So right now, we have close to half of everyone in this room and online belonging to policy influencing organizations. And then we have about 4% who are policy makers. Can I just ask our policy makers, who are you? If you can in, uh, please stand up and be recognized. Our policy makers, or maybe ex policy makers. <laughs> Ajahn Wichan? Any other policymakers? DG Odumsak? Uh, DG Odumsak is here. Any, anyone else? Um, ex or current policymakers, please stand up to be recognized. Okay, we have, we have more. Good, thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, development partners. Who are our development partners here? Can you please stand to be recognized, our development partners? Shane, who else do we have? We have more. Maybe they're online. If you're online, uh, let us know. And then others. Who are these others? It's quite a lot. Who are the others? Anyone representing others? University president? Others? Who are the others? Are early career professionals? MTT fellows? Who else? Good. So there's also so quite a lot actually here with us, but of course, as expected, quite close to half are uh, policy influencing organizations. Thank you. Now, uh, all of those um, issues that Dr. Chayanet mentioned were results of the scoping study conducted at the beginning of the program. Now we're at the midpoint of the program. That's why in the next sessions, we will be reflecting, we'll be discussing about policy influencing. What are the insights? What are the challenges? What are some of the actions that we can take together to improve the way we influence? And we also have policymakers with us who will reflect on how actually they are being influenced or not at all. So something also that we can uh, take into consideration. Now, Let's um, all together uh, come to the, an important part in our program, which is our keynote. May I invite Buri Patlibel, who is MTT Program Coordinator, and Medina, who is our MTT Fellow, to facilitate this session. Hello, good morning everyone. Hope everyone is having a good morning so far and feeling energetic. Uh, my name is Boripat. I'm joined here today with my good friend Medina. Hi everyone, my name is Medina Hadularan. I'm an MTT Jesse Fellow. Yes, and together we'll be co-moderating this really exciting session for you, which is the keynote speech. The agenda is quite straightforward. We'll have a talk on the topic of critical perspectives on PAO and their role in the WEC interfaces in the Mekong. This will be followed by a brief chat, and then that will wrap up our session. So, Medina, who is our special guest speaker today? So, our 
special guest speaker today is Dr. Chishamon, and she's the head of research at Center for Future Defense and National Security at Deakin University in Australia. She's also a UN special rapporteur and member from Asia Pacific States on the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Yes, that's very impressive. But you know what, Medina, what's even more impressive about Dr. Pichmon is she's actually quite funny in person. She is actually very friendly, and also she is a big fan of cats. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Pichmon to the stage to share her talk. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it gives me... Uh, such pleasure to be standing up here, um, but also thank you very much to Medina and Boripat for the very kind introduction. And um, I love sharing more about myself as well, but if at any point it becomes awkward and I am sharing too much information, please let me know. Uh, but as Boripat <laughs> rightly said, in my opinion, I do think I'm funny. Uh, so over the course of my keynote, I may try to be funny and it would be much appreciated if you could please laugh, even if I'm not really funny. Uh, thank you. Oh, didn't expect to applause. Whoever that was, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Woo! Appreciate it so much. Um, all right, so I have just about 20 minutes. I've been told to deliver my, my keynote remarks. Um, but I do note that um, Albert had asked me to make this as critical and interactive and constructive as possible. So I'm going to try and do that uh, by speaking a little bit less um, and giving a bit more time to Q&A and, and also interactions with all of you. Because I know there's a wealth of experience and expertise in this room. And if I'm being honest here, I always feel somewhat nervous to be standing in front of such an esteemed uh, audience. But one of the first things I wanted to say really is that having these types of forums, having the Macron Think Tank project in place is so incredibly valuable um, to all stakeholders I feel in the Macron region and beyond because I think what the MTT represents is the power of the individual as channeled through a um, constructive and also forward-looking community of practice. Um, and this is something that we need to see in the macro re region in order to address those very wicked, messy problems um, that was uh, highlighted uh, early on. And so I think this is where the MTT, and I'm sure the discussions that will happen across uh, the course of today and, and um, this coming, well, this week, what we will see is how that power of the individual highlights the opportunities for real policy entrepreneurship um, at the individual level, but also at the level of the research groups um, that will be presenting their work to all of us. And this is where I think PIOs, um, policy influencing organizations, play a very important role um, because they allow the individual to channel their efforts and their expertise into a bigger group that can leverage their impact even more. And I think compared to the, the concept of think tanks, where we, I think many of us will be aware, think tanks themselves have become more associated with certain political inclinations in many cases, the concept of the PIO is much more politically neutral in that way. And that's very useful because I think what we need is information, not misinformation, not disinformation. We need information that is reliable, that is credible, that is objective also in its political, um, in, in political terms. But it also needs to be politically sensitive, right? So it is important still that the information, the, the research findings, let's say, that one provides is balanced, is credible, as I said earlier, and not politically motivated, but it still needs to take into consideration the politics and the power dynamics that underlie the facts, um, as we often like to say, and look at how those dynamics and those politics permeate the actions of individuals um, how actors in the space that you're, we're working within interact with one another and how they then impact the nature of the issues that we talk about. And I think this is where, and it was again highlighted in the opening um, remarks that we heard already this morning, this is where there is a particular importance in bringing the voices and experiences of at-risk and marginalized groups, um, communities, uh, women, persons with disabilities, children and youths, 
indigenous or ethnic minorities to bring their voices to the table and ensure that their priorities, their needs are reflected in the research that we conduct and indeed in the policy influence or the policy impact that we seek to generate. Within the, within the UN and, and many other spaces that I've been working within, including in academia, obviously, but also in the private sector, we see how discussions about the renewable energy transition, for one, has shifted, have shifted towards the, discuss, the discourse around just transition. I think that shift is one that's very relevant here, right? Because when we're talking about hydropower or solar or wind energy, it's very important for us not to focus just on the technical. It's also important for us to look at the implications that these projects have for the individual, for human beings on the ground. And this is where the concept of just transition becomes very important, but one that has gained such resonance because it reflects how the renewable energy transition is one that cannot just be about um, transitioning just to new technologies, but it's about understanding how these new technologies are also implicated in human rights issues across the entire value chain. We have become much more aware, for instance, that when it comes to extracting critical minerals that are crucial for this energy transition, that many of these minerals are located in the territories of indigenous peoples. And that as a result, their livelihoods, their cultural traditions, their, their communities are adversely impacted if we're not careful. And we see this happen again and again. And so it's very important that even for those of you in the room who are focused more again on the technical, the scientific side of things, that understanding the implications of what you're researching and the projects that you are advocating, understanding the human rights impacts of them are, are paramount to ensuring that the energy transition isn't just a transition, it's actually one that is predicated on the principles of justice, equity, and fairness. And I have other examples, right? But this is, it's in this way that I think when we're thinking about the research interventions that we stand to make in the water, energy, and climate space, this is why they need to be guided by a rights-based approach. And I know that talking about human rights in, in the Asia region, in Southeast Asia, is, is never easy, in part because there is, um, there's always some misunderstanding sometimes, or a difference in understandings as to what a human rights-based approach needs to look like. But I think, fundamentally, a rights-based approach is one that prioritizes engagement with and the protection of marginalized and at-risk groups, um, and it is about making the invisible challenges that they often face on a daily basis, making these challenges as visible as possible, and trying to come up with outcomes, with solutions that can help address those challenges as well. It is also about targeting the deep-seated structures of discrimination on the one hand and inequality on the other that often perpetuate social and environmental justices that we see in the world today, but which we also continue see, to see in the Macron region. And so a rights-based approach really is about addressing those um, systemic sources of inequality, of injustice. Um, it is about ensuring that the research that one does is feeding into a fairer, more sustainable world. And this is why diversity and inclusion are so important. And I'm sure you'll be hearing much more about this over the course of the, the coming days. But I wanted to, to emphasize it now, that if we want to ensure true inclusion in the work that we do, in the research that we do, then it can't just be a box-ticking exercise. All right? we, when it comes to gender um, sensitivity analysis, for instance, it is incredibly important to ensure what many people are calling an intersectional approach. But I'm also mindful that the concept of intersectionality is not one that is easily translated in, in many different languages. And so I wanted to pause for a moment to see how many people in this room feel like there is an adequate translation of the word intersectional in your respective language. Um, can I get a show of hands of how many here feel like they've used the word intersectional in their own um, language before? Okay, excellent, excellent. I wonder, I wonder if, um, how many of, so the remainder, uh, the people who haven't raised their hands, I take it that you don't, you've not used that word before. Can I just get a volunteer um, to share with us the, how the word intersectional is translated into your local language? 
and what does it mean directly? This is where the interactive part comes in, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to make someone feel awkward, so I apologize in advance. But I did see who put their hands up earlier, so I'm walking directly to them. <laughs> Would anyone like to share? I saw some hands up here. Anyone? How intersectional is translated in your language? And uh, there were a couple of people who put their hands up earlier saying that they've used it before. Anyone? Ever so slightly. Okay, I'm not now going to make an awkward joke just to make this a bit less awkward. Or not, actually. Let's just, let's just live in the moment. But anyone at all, volunteer. I'm pretty sure, I wasn't imagining things when I saw hands being raised, right? Pretty sure that wasn't the case. They got scared. Okay, I shouldn't have walked down. I, I mean, as Boropat was saying earlier, I am a very friendly person. Um, I, and I also do love cats, so no need for you to feel... All right. Well, in that case, I won't belabor the point. Um, I, do, I do encourage people to have a think about this uh, further. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take the, the silence just now as an indication that we do actually need to work more when it comes to translating these types of concepts into other languages, literally, but also translate them in policy terms as well. Because what we mean by intersectional is possibly going to look very different um, depending on where you're from. And indeed, even translating the term in English and understanding what it means and what it entails in terms of processes and so forth, that can be difficult too. But at its crux, the idea of intersectional or an intersectional perspective, um, it's really about understanding how one person's experience is not just simply informed by their gender or their race or their position or status within a society or the work that they have, the employment that they have. It's about understanding how all of those identities inform who they are and the experiences as well as the barriers that they then face, especially when it comes to, let's say, participation. And so in that regard, if we want to be truly inclusive, if we want to ensure that there is diversity in the work that we do, we have to ensure that the lived experiences of each and every individual that we are working with, but or whom we intend to impact, um, that their experiences are factored in, that we consider when we look at their gender, not just their gender, but also um, their age, their, their race, their ethnicity, but also the, the employment that they have. And so going back to um, what I was saying earlier about the example of, of the just transition and why it's so important, I've, sp I've spoken to many um, indigenous communities who are impacted by, by hydropower dams or by wind farms or solar farms. And the one thing that they often say to me is that the, the impact looks different. If you're an indigenous man as opposed to an indigenous woman, the impact from those, those projects look different, right? So as a woman, you might not be able to articulate your concerns as vociferously, as strongly as a man, but it's also the case that when it comes to representation at international events, um, like at the UN, it's usually the men who go because they're the ones who are public facing, so to speak, whereas it's the women who have to hold down the fort, who have to stay home and protect their communities. Um, on top of many other burdens that they shoulder, um, looking after their families, um, collecting livelihoods and uh, sources and, and resources and so forth. And so it's those types of differential impacts that we have to consider here. Um, but I would also use that as, a, as a, an example to emphasize another message, which is that at the heart of inclusion, it's not just about ensuring that there are women in the room, um, it's also about ensuring gender equity, right? The fair and just distribution of benefits um, and responsibilities between men and women and other gender diverse groups. And so it's bearing in mind that when we're working towards inclusion, it's not just inclusion itself. It's about creating a more just, a fairer um, system. Uh, it's about creating you know, the, the, in one sense, the community, the society that we want to see. And all of that is really important to ensuring a more sustainable future for all. 
Now, the other um, point, and this is where I'm going to ask for my slides, if, if you don't mind, um, and thank you very much, August and others, uh, helping to facilitate this. The other thing that we have to bear in mind is that when it comes to generating policy impact as a PIO or as an individual, you have to first think about what kind of impact you want to generate. And the impact that you want to generate, as well as the channels in which you generate it, will invariably have an impact as well with respect to how you should approach inclusion, how you should think about the political dynamics. And so I think you need to just keep pressing until all of the different um, diagrams come up. This is me trying to, um, to be fancy. Um, but uh, as you can see, impact in a policy sense can be different, right? You can have short-term, long-term, direct, and indirect. And all of these different types of impact, as I said before, can have an impact. Um, or it, can, it shouldn't shape how you then think about the channels of policy influence you approach, but also the different stakeholder groups that your research or your work stand to influence too. So next slide, please. And then another thing that I think is important for us to bear in mind is that there are different stages in the policy making cycle too. And so when thinking about the impact you want to generate, you also have to think about impact at what policy stage? Is it, is it at the agenda setting stage? Is it at the stage of policy formulation, decision making, policy implementation, policy evaluation, as I think the other, thank you, uh, dot will come up. But all of these different stages will hold different implications with respect to how you conduct um, your inclusion and diversity analysis, but also when it comes to the types of um, the, the, uh, the tactics or the strategies that you use to generate that impact. So let's have a little think about this. Um, and I will look at Boripat um, and Medina to let me know if I need to wrap up soon. Um, but I think, oh, sorry, if you can go to the previous slide, please don't move yet. <laughs> um, if you think about what policy impact looks like at the agenda setting stage, right? This is where the, the problem the policy problem that you want to address is perhaps not yet firm, right? There's still space to negotiate, to discuss what exactly the nature of the problem is um, and what are the, the, real, the realistic um, recommendations or solutions that you can propose. And so there's perhaps a, a more leeway um, for you to input into that process and help set the agenda in terms of what states, what businesses or other international organizations, among others, could focus on. But it's still important nonetheless that at the agenda setting stage, you want to focus on not just what are the nature of the problems, but equally who are the stakeholders who are being impacted. And so this is where questions such as who are the stakeholders um, that are being impacted or who are at risk of being impacted, who are they? Who are the ones who stand to be most influenced or impacted by our research? It's also asking questions like, um, uh, how can we access these, these stakeholder groups? How can we also leverage them to influence the agenda? So it's about thinking both specifically and broadly in that way. And then if you contrast that with, let's say, policy evaluation, the very last point on that, um, on that cycle, and I think many might have been involved in monitoring and evaluation processes or, or projects, you will know that the questions you ask are somewhat similar, but they also look rather different because then it's more about assessing the impacts that have uh, emerged from a specific project or program, right? And so that's where you can ask in more, even more definitive terms who have been impacted by this project? Um, are there rights holders or stakeholders who are yet to be thoroughly considered um, as part of the, the policy making process or as part of the design of a specific project? Um, and also, um, who are what, are what are the next steps? Who are the other stakeholders or experts that we can consult? And so the nature of the questions fundamentally remain quite similar, but also different. One is focused more on the future, I would say, and one is a little bit more focused on what has happened, right? But at the heart here is about understanding who stands to gain from your research, who stands to potentially lose from your research, and who can your research benefit the most? 
And so bearing in mind those three questions, I would say, is really instructive and very um, crucial to carving out or crafting um, a holistic but also um, impactful research and policy agenda. The next point I wanted to emphasize, and please move on to the next uh, slide, is that when it comes to engaging in useful policy research, thinking about the stakeholders is very important, but it's also thinking in terms of accountability and in terms of timeliness. So if you could please put up all of the, the points there. Um, in short, you can think of this as the tactical approach. So timeliness, accountability, clarity, uh, trustworthiness, impact, consistency, clarity, and legitimacy. All of these different factors are crucial to ensuring that the research that you do is policy relevant, but also that it generates long-lasting and meaningful impact. I won't go into each of these one by one. I'll be happy to speak to each of them more later. But I think some of the key points to note here is, in fact, um, about how each of these uh, elements speak to the overarching need for research to also be accountable. Right? We often tell policymakers that their policies have to be accountable to the stakeholders that are impacted. Our research has to do the same, especially if we're wanting that research to become policy relevant. Um, and so without a clarity of purpose or without um, actionability, ensuring that there are actual practical recommendations that emerge from your research, then ensuring accountability is going to, look, is going to be very difficult. Um, and so this is why I think when it comes to, to PIOs, this is where there is almost like an inbuilt accountability mechanism, right? Because you're operating as a community of scholars, of practitioners, you're not on your own. And this is where you can help ensure that your peers, your colleagues, are actually um, creating recommendations that are actionable, um, timely, and that they are also consistent with the broader values and principles that your community of practice is meant to, is meant to represent um, and really push forward in, in other uh, realms of policy engagement. The very final point, and I'm just going to leave this slide up there because I think it's worth discussing further later if we have the time. The final point I wanted to make is that when it comes to ensuring inclusion and diversity, when it comes to ensuring that your research speaks to the priorities that we see on the ground, um, but that it is also accountable um, to those who stand to be impacted by it, it's important that you yourselves um, represent that inclusion and diversity, um, that you yourself and it represents the inclusion that you want to, uh, to push forward in the policy realm. And by this, I mean, it's important that your research teams are inclusive, that it's not you know, only with men, um, or indeed only, I would even say, with women, but it needs to have that broad-based um, representation of the different genders we see in the world today, wherever possible. But it's also about your own behaviors as researchers, as policy entrepreneurs, as agents of change. I've seen in so many spaces how gatekeeping, for example, becomes very common, where people try to keep the information that they've gained, the knowledge that they've gained just to themselves, and they prevent it from being shared with other people. I've also seen instances where unless you go and speak with a particular organization, you're never going to get access to the stakeholders that they work with. All of, that, all of those examples are examples of gatekeeping. And as, as researchers, as scientists, as people who want to affect positive change in society, it's important that we don't keep the information we generate just to ourselves or for our own personal gain. It's important to ensure that your research is out there and that it is benefiting as many people as possible. And so again, I think this comes back to the point um, I made earlier and the recognition I want to give to the MTT um, of it being that really open and inclusive space, one that can be further leveraged to ensure that knowledge um, is a source of power, but it is a power that is shared by everyone and not held by just a few. And so on that note, I'm going to hand it back to our moderators, um, moderators, <laughs> to, um, to continue with the discussion. But thank you very much, and I look forward to engaging with all of you more over the course of, of today and, and the coming days.
So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pichamon, for your fruitful and uh, beneficial talk. Uh, and I'm sure that we would like to hear more about it, right, Boripat? Yeah, sure. Dr. Pichamon, please join us on these very tall chairs for a cozy chat. Okay, so thank, thank you again, Dr. Pishamon, for, for that talk. Uh, I think we have some maybe some follow-up uh, conversations that we want to have for you. And I think maybe my first question is kind of related to what you were trying to get people to talk about, about translating intersectionality or translating JETSI. But it's also a question that uh, is kind of inspired to some conversations that we had yesterday, whereby we, these concepts like JETSI and intersectionality, they are Western concepts, mm -hmm. and it's being argued that they need to be adapted to the local or regional context. And to be honest, when I, when I, when I hear that, my, I, I kind of have mixed reactions, mm -hmm. because on the one side, yes, because these are general concepts, they have to be translated and have to be adapted to some extent, but the other part of me that says no is that my concern is that when you adapt uh, JETSI or intersectionality kind of concepts, what gets lost in translation, and will that kind of weaken JETSI, or weaken, or by the same token, will it weaken equity? And so I, my question is, to what extent is JETSI as a concept, or inter, intersectionality as a concept, flexible or adaptable? And similarly, to what extent is equitable equ or equity uh, reinterpretable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Um, I feel like it's PhD level quite, you know, question in terms of like you can write an entire thesis or theses about it. Um, and I know that there are, are gender experts in the room as well. But look, I, I agree with you actually because this applies not just to the concept of intersectionality or equity, it also applies to the, the, the concept of human rights itself, right? And there is a tendency, sorry, these chairs aren't the most comfortable for me either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm awkwardly sitting and standing, but it's okay. I, I do like this format. It's, um, it, it, it's closer and it's not as high up. So. Um, the point I was trying to make, though, is that you're right. These kind of key terms that in some ways have been politicized um, can stand to be uh, manipulated in ways that we don't want it to be manipulated in. And as I said earlier, the fundamental idea um, behind the concept of intersectionality, for one, is that we have to bear in mind the differential experiences of people and how those experiences have been informed by different power dynamics, right? Depending on their status, their position within society, within the within um, within their communities. So, if we take as our departure point that very simple, straightforward idea that people are very different, um, that's really all that intersectionality helps to spotlight. It doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Um, in a way. And similarly, when we think about the concept of equity or human rights, it's the same. Equity is ensuring fairness, ensuring justice, ensuring that we recognize how men and women start at different, have, have different experiences, um, and there are different barriers that stand in their way. And therefore, ensuring equity is bearing in mind that there are those barriers that are specifically unique to women, and to un, un, um, dismantle um, those barriers, we need to do things differently. So a one-size-fits-all um, one approach is not what we should be pursuing. It's about tailoring the research that we do, the influence that we want to generate um, in ways that speak to the experiences of those different stakeholder groups. And similarly for human rights, it's basically the idea that we all have rights and those rights should be protected. So when we drill it down, um, I don't think any of these concepts are necessarily contentious. It's more there are people out there who are trying to make it contentious, but for those of us in the room and listening online, we have to just stay, stay strong and, and don't let our own principles and values, um, our understandings of these concepts be swayed um, so easily. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Pishimona. And to add to your question earlier, you were, you were asking us about uh, have you ever used interse intersectionality concept? I have used, but in English. And now, uh, since I'm a Thai, but I'm an ethnic minority, I'm from the south of Thailand, um, I used it in, um, in, in the Malay, local Malay. And it, for me, it's very challenging. And as a Thai, I actually Googled it just now. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, so it, in Thai, it's, it means ความสัมพันธ์เชิงตัด and I didn't understand. That's different it. from yeah. what I saw. ความสัมพันธ์เชิงตัดกันแล้วก็เลยโอเค that's 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 challenging even to 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 interpret mm. or to 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 explain to others in in even my own language or in Malay, local Malay language. Oh yeah. no, I, I agree. I, I actually, I always have to um, do a Google search uh, of what intersectionality means before I do a, any remarks on intersectionality. And um, in fact, the Thai translation I got from my search is different from yours. So the one I got is I'm not tapson, which means overlapping power interests in a way. But what you said just now is more focused on the sectional, the intersecting component. So it's interesting even how in one language, right. the concept is translated quite differently and as a result would have slightly different meanings too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah. If I can also interject in the conversation right now, because we actually have an in online participant who told us what the word in Vietnamese is oh, for intersectionality. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's why I'm going to request Dr. Sin if you can approach Kun Klumjit and please translate what the person is saying, because it's written in, 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 in Vietnamese. This is very exciting. I feel like we need a drum roll. Yeah, I think so. in Vietnamese we uh, interpret it as a multi-dimension, something like uh, from, from different angles, so seeing the point from different angles. So some, something uh, literally translated in Vietnamese. Yeah. So um, our, yeah, our Vietnamese um, colleagues also have shown us that there's also a different interpretation on the word intersectionality. So over to you again, sorry. Oh, thank you very much. That's super interesting, actually. Uh, Medina, do you have a question to Dr. Pichamon? Yeah, I, I actually do. So my question is, how can we bring equity um, and uh, inclusion in the earliest stage of our, since we're, I, I'm sure that we are doing projects and programs, uh, so how can we bring that concept into our earliest stage to our program? That's, a, that's a, another great question. And I would say you bring it into the earliest stages of your program planning by talking about it, right? So any conversation around project design, um, and I can see gigantic X just now. Time's up, people. Um, so, I mean, just talking about it is, is the first step, right? Ensuring that it's very much, much part of the, um, the project, the concept note that you develop, um, the indicators that you build into the monitoring and evaluation component of your project. All of those things happen early on, but it, there needs to be a consensus amongst those of you involved in the project that these are important issues. Um, and I would say similarly, it's important to ensure early on that you're asking um, the useful questions too. Who are the people that you want your project to, to influence? Who do you want, who do you in anticipate your project influencing? Um, but also impacting um, is another one. And so thinking in those terms will ensure that you identify the stakeholders um, and the, beneficiary, the beneficiaries of your projects and ensuring that they that those benefits are, are as equitable as possible. Um, so I think it's, it's actually quite simple in a way, but it, it harks back to the idea of doing your due diligence, right, and ensuring that impacts both positive and negative are accounted for in how you conduct your research and the types of policy impact that you anticipate will emerge from that research. So actually the time is up. <laughs> I'm sure that we would like to continue more on this conversation. So any, do you have any um, one last thoughts, um, key takeaway from, 
for us um, from this? This will be more than five minutes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just it uh, <laughs> well, it, in terms of my last thoughts, is just to reiterate or repeat what I said earlier, which is that I, for one, firmly believe in the power of the individual, especially the individual researcher, to affect change that is meaningful. Um, and I think for us, knowledge is power. That's all right. Knowledge is power. Um, and ensuring that that power is shared is really crucial. Um, but one way to ensure that that knowledge is shared is through communication and through reporting your findings, which I know the MTT program puts a real, um, real focus on. Because ultimately, if your research isn't out there, if you're not constantly talking to people about it, ensuring that the communities you have worked with also receive that information back, then that knowledge is not going to be shared. And the impact that you'll be able to generate will be much less... Um, much less meaningful as a result. So I think I'll just end on that point, which is that please communicate um, and please do share your knowledge and expertise because that's only that's the way forward in terms of how this community of practice can continue to grow and for us to see the Mekong region benefit even more from all of the policy influence or influencing organizations that currently exist and that will emerge, I'm sure, in the coming years. Thank you very much, Ajahn Pichamon and Buripat and Medina for that exciting um, keynote and for reminding us of, of sometimes just, just the power of a term, right? And how it can be quite actually confusing just trying to understand that term. Again, a big round of applause to everyone. Uh, just before we proceed, can I just invite you to take part in an installation which is outside. It's called The Threads That Bind Us. It's an interactive installation that visually maps out complex data patterns to uncover the intricate relationships that bind us to our environments. It's outside. There will be ushers who can help you in that installation. Now, this is an important part of the program. Just before we go for coffee break, can I just invite everyone to please stand up? And if you can just walk towards the front and face the camera. Yeah, come, stand up. Walk towards the front and face the camera. This is our group photo. And also, we're going to ask our online to participants to please open your camera so that you can be part of uh, the group photo. So please just line up around here. And then face towards the back. The cameras are at the back. So... Come closer. Can I ask uh, Dr. Chayanit to stay in front so that everyone can just walk towards Dr. Chayanit? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to open the cameras also for our online participants so that they can be part of. Okay, just please stand and then our photographer is behind. Can we all squeeze towards the middle, please? Towards Dr. Chayanit, a bit closer. Our online participants, can you open your camera so that you can be part of the group photo? Okay, just a minute. You can also take the stage if you feel that you cannot be seen. The stage is also available for everyone. Okay, some people on this corner, if you can just go up stage because this side cannot be seen. So, yeah. And, and give us your best smile. Oh. Um. Yeah, on the right, my right hand side, can you just please go up? Because we cannot see around here. Can you just please go up into this on the stage? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, we will remove the first of the chair. The first row we will remove off. Uh, can we also turn off the lights over here? Because it's too bright there. Um, on my right, on my left hand side, can we just squeeze up in uh, on the stage, please? Okay. The light is okay. Okay, right now we we would love to see all of your smiles. So I'm being count in maybe smile, smile first, smile first, then hand later. Okay, um, your smile in three, two, one, please, everyone. Okay, any freestyle right now? In three, two. One, please, everyone. Yes. It's called mini heart. Sorry, everyone. Even though you have a big heart, please. In three, two, one. Yes. Okay. Okay, sorry, sorry. One last, one last. Please, we need your voice. And because we are going to take a short clip video, maybe we say yay. But we need everyone to just say yay together. Just yay, something like that. Because we will take uh, small clips. Let, let's do in three, two, one. Yay! One more, please. One, two, three, please. Yay. I know everyone needs a coffee break. <laughs> please enjoy your coffee break. Thank you very much, Kun O. Uh, now let's uh, have some refreshments. Um, we have about 15 minutes for coffee break. And those who need uh, reimbursements, please see the finance desk outside. <laughs> 